Hello, welcome to a book a day. Today I'm going to interpret for you a classic book on family education. It's called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. It discusses the issue of communication with children. We often say that communication is an art. And when it comes to communication between adults, we emphasize methods and techniques. However, adults often feel helpless when communicating with children because the methods that work in the adult world don't seem to apply to children. Children often seem unreasonable and sometimes even impolite. They are often emotional, crying for no reason, causing trouble for no reason, and no matter how adults try to persuade them, they don't listen. And sometimes, you really want to care for your child, but they ignore you. They lock themselves in their rooms, secretly wiping away tears, refusing to tell you what's really going on and share their true feelings. Children not listening and not speaking. Both situations are headache-inducing. In such situations, parents sometimes feel confused and sometimes frustrated. They can't help but shout at their children, and even resort to physical violence. In the end, both sides end up exhausted and hurt, and the parent-child relationship becomes tense. It seems like there's an invisible wall between adults and children, and they often don't understand each other's inner thoughts, making communication difficult. This book, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk, is a highly practical book. It discusses various misconceptions in communicating with children and how to effectively communicate with children in different situations, allowing children to feel close to you, to be willing to listen and speak, and ultimately to become independent earlier. This book was published in the United States in 1980 and has sold over 3 million copies in the United States to date. It is one of the best-selling books on family education in the United States. The author's How to Talk series represented by this book has sold over 10 million copies worldwide and has been translated into more than 30 languages, including Chinese. It continues to be popular and is used as training material by over 200,000 parent-child groups worldwide. The two authors of the book, Adele Faber and Elaine Maslish, are internationally renowned experts in parent-child communication. They are both mothers of three children, and their names are included in the American Husu. In addition to writing, they also conduct parent-child communication training for parents teachers, and counselors in various companies' communities, and educational institutions around the world. During this process, they have collected a large number of cases in family education, including both successful experiences and lessons learned from failures, which they have incorporated into the book. So, the book is not just the personal experience of two children's education experts, but a collection of experiences from many families. Through long-term practice, the two authors have developed a set of language skills, that have helped many families build harmonious parent-child relationships. In this book, the authors divide all communication scenarios with children into five main themes. Helping children face their feelings. Encouraging children to cooperate with us. Replacing punishment with effective methods. Learning to appreciate children. And encouraging children to become independent. Next, I will explain each theme to you in order. Part 1. First, the first theme is helping children face their feelings. What does this mean? Let's take a few examples. When a child says to you, Dad, I'm tired. Mom, my stomach hurts, Dad. This show is boring, Mom. I hate Grandma. How do you usually respond? Would you say you just woke up? How can you be tired? Are you pretending to have a stomach ache because you don't want to go to school? This show is interesting. How can it be boring? You're being disrespectful to Grandma. She's so good to you. If you respond like this, then you are falling into the first common misconception, which is denying and ignoring the child's feelings. Adults often arrogantly think that children are young and don't understand, or they believe that the child's issue is too trivial to be mentioned, so they habitually deny and ignore the child's feelings. What are the consequences of this? The authors say, when a child's feelings are constantly denied, they feel confused and angry. It also implies that children should not understand their own feelings or trust their own feelings. Denying and ignoring a child's feelings will make the child dislike communicating with you, they will feel that you don't believe in them, don't understand them, and talking to you is uninteresting. Sometimes they may even argue with you. Over time, a rift forms between you and your child. The second common misconception is giving advice and lecturing, using a tone that is half-blaming and half-preaching, stating many things that the child already knows. In fact, whether it's adults or children, when they are sad and upset, the last thing they want to hear is these things. They will find your words annoying and feel that they are not understood. The third misconception is expressing excessive sympathy, acting as a psychologist, or asking too many questions. This will make the child feel pitiful and useless, and excessive questioning will make them defensive and resentful, making them feel even more frustrated. 
So what should parents do when a child is feeling sad, angry, or disappointed? The author provides four techniques. First, listen attentively. You can't play with your phone or watch TV while pretending to listen to your child. If you do, the child will feel that you don't care about their feelings. Second, respond to the child with simple words. You don't need long speeches. Responding with oh hum or I see is enough. Show your agreement with the child's feelings. Third, state the child's feelings. For example, child, you seem very angry. You must be feeling disappointed. It sounds like you dislike doing homework. This way the child will feel that you understand them. Fourth, when you can't fulfill the child's wishes immediately, you can try using imagination. For example, I really wish I could turn an ice cream for you right now so you can eat it. In summary, you need to empathize with your child. When a child feels that their inner feelings are respected and acknowledged, they will be willing to express more of their thoughts, and they may even come up with solutions to problems on their own. The book provides many examples, such as when a child's pet turtle dies and they feel sad. In such a situation, many parents might say, it's just a small turtle, why are you crying like this? I'll buy you another one, you see. This is ignoring the child's feelings and judging the child based on an adult's perspective. The child might say you don't understand at all. I want this one, you might respond with. You're just being unreasonable eventually. The two end up arguing. So, what is a more effective way to respond? The author provides an example. Child, my turtle died this morning. Dad, oh really? I didn't expect that. Child, I was teaching it to play games. Dad, you two seem to have a good time together. Child, it was my good friend. Dad, it's hard to lose a friend. You cared about that little turtle. As you can see, the child's feelings are fully acknowledged, and their emotions are released. Therefore, they will calm down quickly, and accept the sad reality. The author says that sometimes parents don't express the child's feelings, because they worry that it will make the child even sadder. But in fact, when the child hears those words, they feel comforted the book emphasizes that our attitude is more crucial than language skills. If we don't empathize with the child, no matter what we say, it will seem fake and manipulative to them. Part 2. Helping children face their feelings requires strong empathy and patience. However, overall, this is relatively easier to achieve. On the other hand, the second theme, which is encouraging children to cooperate with us, is more challenging. It's important to note that encouraging children to cooperate with us does not mean turning them into obedient and well-behaved children. Instead, it means cultivating positive character traits and habits in children from an early age, promoting their independence. Anxious parents who are concerned about parenting all hope that their children will listen to them. However, it often turns out contrary to their wishes because there are many misconceptions when it comes to encouraging children to cooperate with us. The most common mistakes include blaming, scolding, threatening, commanding, and mocking. These approaches may have some effect at times, but fundamentally, they are a form of violence and forcing the child using your power. Sometimes, children may temporarily comply due to fear, but deep down they resist. Sometimes they may even refuse to cooperate and develop a rebellious attitude because their emotions are not released and they don't genuinely identify with you. They simply find you scary annoying and want to get away from you as soon as possible. So what should be the correct approach to encourage children to cooperate with us? The author also provides four techniques. The first one is describing, describing the problem you see. For example, if a child is playing with water and forgets to turn off the tap, causing the bathroom to be flooded, Instead of scolding the child, you only need to describe the situation you observe saying, sweetie, the water in the bathtub has overflowed. The child will immediately realize their mistake. Describing aims to avoid blame and reproach. The author mentions a small tip, which is to omit the word you when describing the problem. For example, instead of saying, you spilled the milk, or you broke the bottle, which sound like blaming, you can say, the milk spilled, or the bottle broke this way. It becomes a description of an objective fact without the emotion of discontent. The second technique is offering simple prompts. For instance, if a child finishes playing with toys and doesn't tidy up, leaving the house messy, you don't need to yell at them or lecture them about cleanliness. Just give a simple reminder, such as saying, toys need to go back to their place. The child will immediately understand. The third technique is expressing your feelings. For example, if a child constantly interrupts you while speaking, being impolite, you can state your feelings saying, I feel upset when you interrupt me before I finish speaking. Note that it's about expressing your own feelings, not criticizing. So, what would be considered criticism? For example, saying, You're so rude, always interrupting me. Many books on parenting emphasize using a positive and affirmative attitude to discipline children, as if parents shouldn't have any negative emotions. 
However, the authors of this book offer a different perspective. They believe that parents can express their feelings, which can relieve their burden. Parents don't have to be endlessly patient, and children are not as fragile as we imagine in the author's view. If we pretend to be patient even when we're clearly angry, it might backfire. Children may not realize the seriousness of the issue or the errors in their behavior, so we can express our emotions. But it's important to avoid using offensive language and threatening the child. The fourth technique is writing notes and placing them in different locations at home as reminders. For example, sticking a note on the TV saying, "Before turning on the TV, think about whether you finished your homework." This way, you can avoid arguing with the child every time they want to watch TV or do homework. And children actually look forward to receiving little notes, just like receiving gifts. Additionally, the author suggests that whether we're speaking or writing notes, it's helpful to use the word "please" when requesting cooperation from the child. This sets an example of politeness for the child and establishes a democratic and equal family atmosphere, which will make the child feel more self-respected and more willing to be close to you. The authors state that encouraging children to cooperate with us is not about using a set of methods to manipulate the child into obedience. Instead, it's about fostering their initiative, sense of responsibility, and the ability to consider others' needs. If we can find the right language, it will protect the child's emotional well-being. Part three: the third theme is about punishment. When children do something wrong, many parents tend to criticize them, and if criticism doesn't work, the only solution they can think of is punishment. Whether or not children should be punished is a question that each parent may answer differently, based on their own reasons. Supporters of a tiger mom or wolf dad style of parenting strongly advocate for necessary punishment. They believe that if a child makes a mistake without facing any punishment, they won't realize their mistake and may repeat it in the future. On the other hand, proponents of positive discipline firmly oppose punishment. They believe that punishment is ineffective and can make children resentful, guilty, or develop low self-esteem. Outweighing any benefits. However, even parents who don't advocate for punishing children may unintentionally punish them at times. For example, telling a child, "You did something wrong, so no ice cream for you today," or "You made the room so dirty, you're not allowed to go watch a movie with us tonight." Although these statements and actions may not be severe, they still fundamentally constitute punishment. The authors of this book oppose any form of punishment because they believe that punishment is ineffective and can reduce a child's sense of guilt for their wrong behavior. Children may think that punishment can offset their mistakes, giving them the freedom to repeat their errors without remorse. Furthermore, the child's energy will be diverted to how to retaliate against the parent, missing the opportunity for self-reflection on their improper behavior and thinking about correcting their mistakes, which is a crucial process. The authors advocate for using alternative methods instead of punishment, summarized as allowing children to experience the natural consequences of their actions. Natural consequences refer to the results that naturally occur if there is no external intervention. This may still sound a bit abstract, so let's give an example. Suppose a child is running around in the aisle while shopping with their mother, which can easily lead to collisions with merchandise and other customers. If the mother says, "You're being reckless, no TV for you tonight," that's essentially punishment. So, what methods can replace punishment? The authors list several. The first method is expressing a clear stance of strong disagreement. But being careful not to attack the child's character. For example, you can say to the child, "I don't like it when you behave like this. Running around in the aisle disturbs other people's shopping." The second method is offering choices. You can say to the child, "Here are two options: either walk properly or sit in the shopping cart. You decide." If the child still doesn't listen, the third method is taking action. For example, you can directly place the child in the shopping cart. If none of these methods work and the mother has to leave the supermarket with the child, Then the fourth method is letting the child experience the natural consequences of their improper behavior. The next day, instead of giving a long lecture, the mother leaves the child at home and goes shopping alone. The child will surely realize that they weren't taken along because of their reckless behavior in the supermarket. This is a moment of reflection, and the child may plead with the mother for another chance. However, the mother should firmly tell the child there will be other opportunities, but today I want to go by myself. This allows the child to experience the natural consequences of their behavior. Another method is the fifth one, which involves telling the child how to make amends for their mistakes. For example, the next time the child goes shopping with the mother, they can help pick fruits or cooperate with the mother. If the child continues to repeat their behavior despite all efforts, there's a sixth method. It involves discussing the child's feelings and needs, and then finding a solution together. Write down all the ideas without judgment and let the child choose those solutions that both parties can accept. Finally, put those solutions into action. 
This is about parents and children facing problems together. It's important to note that the purpose of these methods is not to punish the child but to correct their improper behavior and help them learn to take responsibility. The authors remind us that when conflicts arise between us and our children, we should not focus on opposing each other or worry about winning or losing. Instead, we should direct our energy towards solving the problem. Part 4. All right, after discussing alternative methods to punishment, let's move on to the fourth theme, which is about learning to appreciate children. We know that in Chinese, there is an idiom called clear punishment and hidden rewards. The authors don't support punishment, but they do support appreciation. Why do they support appreciating children? Because they believe that appreciation can help children develop a positive and authentic self-image. How one evaluates themselves directly influences their core value thinking patterns, emotions, hopes, and life goals. Appreciation can help children build confidence and self-esteem, allowing them to have a more positive self-evaluation. Some people may say, appreciation means saying nice things, that's easy, I can do it effortlessly, however, appreciation involves saying kind words. That's true. But those kind words are not to be casually thrown around. There are also some common misunderstandings about appreciation. Sometimes, even when the appreciation is well-intentioned, it can elicit unexpected negative reactions. Therefore, appreciation also needs to be approached with care. The authors say that some forms of appreciation can make the person being appreciated doubt the sincerity. For example, does he really think I'm good at cooking? He's either lying or doesn't know about good food. Sometimes appreciation can lead to denial. For instance, he praises me like this, but did he not see how disheveled I looked an hour ago? Sometimes, appreciation can create pressure. For example, everyone praises me like this, how should I dress for the next event? And sometimes, appreciation can make people feel controlled causing them to suspect. Does this person want something for me? Don't we often say, everyone likes to hear good things? Why is it that sometimes people have negative reactions after receiving appreciation? The fundamental reason is that the way appreciation is expressed is not right. The author distinguishes between two types of appreciation, evaluative appreciation and descriptive appreciation. The author believes that generally, it is evaluative appreciation that can trigger negative reactions. Evaluative appreciation includes words like smart, beautiful, perfect, excellent, wonderful, great, and fantastic. These are evaluative words that put the person being appreciated in a subordinate position. This may create a sense of inequality and discomfort. Sometimes the more you use these words to praise a child, the more they may refuse or become disheartened because they feel that the praise is insincere. They will focus on their mistakes and think, if you say I'm already perfect, why should I continue to strive? Therefore, the author says, if we want to encourage children to believe in themselves and persist, we need to avoid using evaluative words, so how can we do it? It's simple. Just use descriptive language with an appreciative tone to describe what you see and feel. When children hear this descriptive appreciation, they can genuinely recognize themselves. Here are two examples. If a child tidies their room very neatly, instead of evaluating by saying what a well-behaved child, describe what you see and feel. For example, you have put everything in its place on the shelves and the floor is cleaned up nicely. Stepping into this room feels very comfortable. This will make the child feel a sense of pride. Another example, if a child knits a scarf by hand, instead of a simple evaluative statement like you've knitted it beautifully, it looks great, the child may lack self-confidence and doubt. Does mom really like it? Is she just being polite? But if you use descriptive language like the vibrant color resembles a sunset, each row is knitted evenly, and it has a thick rolled edge. It will be very warm to wear in winter. After hearing this, the child will think her mom really likes it. The book also provides a helpful technique, which is to conclude the appreciation with a word. For example, you have been studying words for over an hour, that's called patience you said you would be home by 5 o'clock. And you came back exactly at 5 o'clock. That's called punctuality you noticed that these plants were dry. So you watered them. That's called initiative. You see, by doing this, you not only appreciate the child but also help them establish correct values and good habits. This will empower the child through these daily descriptions, continuously strengthening their inner strength. Part 5. All right. The final theme is encouraging children to become independent. Whether it's through parenting or education, the ultimate goal is not just to impart knowledge, but to help children become independent. What does it mean to be independent? Renowned psychologist Alfred Adler, in his book The Courage to Be Happy, provides a classic definition. I've also interpreted this book in an audio program. He says independence means breaking away from the lifestyle of childhood and freeing oneself from self-centeredness. It means no longer seeing oneself as the center of everything and expecting the world to revolve around oneself. 
Instead, it's gradually freeing oneself from dependence on adults and learning to face life's challenges independently. During the process of growing up, children develop a self-driven motivation to achieve independence. Depending too much on adults can make them feel incapable and worthless, and it may even lead to resentment and frustration towards adults. However, at times, children can also become attached to their dependence on adults and resist taking responsibility. This is where terms like big baby and mommy's boy come from. The responsibility of parents is to encourage and help children achieve independence. So how can we encourage children to become independent? The author provides six suggestions. The first point is to let children make choices for themselves. When children are very young, many things require following the arrangements made by adults. If adults can provide children with more opportunities to make choices, it will enhance their sense of control over life. We can start with small choices, such as what clothes to wear, what dish to eat, where to go for playtime, when to take a bath, and so on. Letting children participate in decision-making rather than arranging everything for them creates opportunities for them to make choices. This way, in the future, they will be more confident and at ease when making career choices, choosing their lifestyle, or selecting a life partner. The second point is to respect the child's efforts. Many things may seem insignificant to adults, but they can be challenging for children. When children make an effort, regardless of how well they perform, we should encourage them positively instead of pouring cold water on their efforts. For example, when a child ties their shoelaces for the first time, cooks a meal for the first time, or performs on stage for the first time, they may not do it perfectly, but we should respect their effort. As long as they receive respect, they will gain more confidence and focus their energy on completing tasks. For instance, if a child enthusiastically wants to learn cooking and ends up making a mess in the kitchen instead of saying, look at what a mess you've made in the kitchen, you're clumsy. Let me do it. You can provide guidance while respecting the child's desire to learn and their effort. The third point is not to ask too many questions. As children reach a certain age, they gradually develop independent thinking and have their own thoughts and secrets. We shouldn't constantly pry or invade their privacy but allow them to have their own independent space. When children want to share something with you, they will naturally speak up. The fourth point is when a child asks you a question, don't rush to provide the answer. Encourage them to think for themselves find answers on their own, or seek external resources. This can include neighbors, friends, professionals, the library, or the internet as channels for problem solving. The author says, asking the child questions in return for their questions, and guiding them to further thinking, is the most helpful approach. The process of seeking answers is as valuable as the answer itself. By training children from a young age to think independently and solve problems, they will be equipped to handle complex social issues in the future. Period. The fifth point is not to crush a child's hope. Every child has many lofty dreams during childhood, even though they may not be mature or most of them may not come true. However, parents should never easily crush a child's dreams because you never know their potential and their capacity for great achievements. Avoid making negative statements to a child, such as with your math grades. Do you still want to become an engineer? Forget about it, or you lose interest in everything you do, you'll never accomplish anything. Such words can have a significant impact on a child. Instead, we should encourage children to boldly try. In relation to this point, there's a famous story. One evening, a six-year-old child suddenly ran outside and started playing wildly. As the boy was jumping around, he shouted to his mother, Mom, I want to jump to the moon. The mother didn't scold the child or dismiss his unrealistic idea. She simply said, Sure, just don't forget to jump back from the moon to have dinner at home. Who would have known that over 30 years later? This child would become the first person in human history to set foot on the moon. That person was Neil Armstrong. You see, never destroy a child's dreams, because it could be the starting point of their brilliant future accomplishments. The final point is to help children free themselves from various roles and labels. Many adults, including parents and teachers, often irresponsibly label children with various tags. For example saying, this child has a stubborn personality, or that child is lazy, mischievous, or foolish, these labels can have a profound impact on a child's psychology, and they may be forever confined to that defined role. Therefore, on one hand, we shouldn't label children with negative tags, and on the other hand, we should help children break free from existing negative labels and provide them opportunities to see a completely new version of themselves. Conclusion Alright, I've finished summarizing the core content of this book. Let's recap. We discussed five major themes for communicating with children, helping children face their emotions, encouraging cooperation with children, replacing punishment with effective methods, learning to appreciate children, 
and encouraging children to become independent. This book is highly practical, offering many specific methods and tools that are worth trying. When it comes to communicating with children, using the right methods can save effort and yield better results, while using the wrong methods can be emotionally draining. However, do these methods apply to every child and every situation? Not necessarily, because humans are extremely complex, and there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Therefore, you need to understand the psychological needs and behavioral characteristics we discussed, as well as the underlying psychological principles, in order to apply the methods effectively. Lastly, I want to say that communicating with children is an ongoing game with no limits. It requires a significant amount of time, energy, emotions, and wisdom. Every child has unlimited potential, and perhaps we should be more patient in safeguarding their growth and providing them with a happier childhood. All right, that covers the essence of this book. Congratulations on completing another book.